Okay, so we have talked about the water power that powered all of the Treader Ironworks. We've talked about the men, the manpower that really kept everything going here. But now we're talking about what they're actually producing, and that's the firepower. Yes. Uh, so where are we right now? So right now we're in one of our furnaces that we have left over. Uh, it's a reverberatory furnace that is attached to the gun foundry building. Uh, so specifically the gun foundry building that we still have on site today. Uh, it was started back in 1861, completed 1863, but it was built for the purpose of casting cannon. They needed a bigger space and more space at that. Right, wow, of course. I mean, if you're the main uh, artillery and armament source for the Confederacy, this you're gonna need extra need space. <laughs> okay, so what are they doing in this area, especially in this back part of the furnace here? What's, what's the primary purpose? So I mentioned with the canal and the batowmen that they're bringing a lot of coal and iron ore in. Right. Uh, so they are feeding it into the furnace. You can see some of the doors that we still have here. Uh, the main purpose is to put as much coal in as you can and to get this thing as hot as possible. It has to melt a lot of iron. Uh, there are actually troughs that connect the furnace into the gun foundry building so that once it was hot enough and you got the iron in there, it would melt eventually go into the gun foundry building and that is where they are actually casting the cannon. Wow. And now I'm sure that this is not a this is a hot process, this is a sweaty and heavy process. Um, how would you say the Richmond Times Dispatch or the Richmond Dispatch really describe this as well? Uh, most commonly they describe this entire site as definitely loud. Uh, it was not pleasant to work here at the Iron Works. Uh, yeah. It was very noisy, very hot. There were hour shifts typically and um, this thing is just running and constantly churning out goods especially during the summer. Right so it's relatively quiet now compared it is. to this. It's very <laughs> silent now. Cool cool well so if you're putting in a whole bunch of iron into this you're getting men working that those long hours uh, what are they producing really? Um, so we've got a lot of cannons that is being passed. We've thrown around the numbers a little over a thousand one of the biggest cannon that was made here at Treasure was the Columbia. Um, so that's quite a name to put on one of the cannon. Uh, it roughly took about 19,000 pounds of iron just to make this one cannon. 19,000 uh, pounds. pounds? Yes. How long would it take to make a 19,000 pounds worth of iron cannon? The entire process, um, including hollowing it out and everything, took about a month just to make this one cannon. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then we got to go over the process of making these cannons. All right. Well, I'm excited about this next part. Yeah, of course. We'll we'll move right into it so we can look at the actual crafting of the cannons. Yes. Itself. Cool. Okay. So we are looking now at actually crafting the cannon, and I'm sure this requires a lot of materials, right? It does. Okay. So I have my minis. I'll right. explain it a little bit more. So the first step in the cannon casting process is that you need a pattern. Okay. So what is the pattern? What does it do? So, the pattern is a bowl, basically. Uh, so you are going to pack things like clay, ash, water around it okay. uh, to try and create a mold around the pattern that you have, and it will harden. So basically, it's going to be like concrete right. once it hardens. And then, once you have that mold of a cannon, that is when you can put it in to something like the flask. Okay. So this is the biggest part of the cannon. Waiting, it's got it's used the pattern to create the, the shape inside, mm -hmm. and then we're starting to pour. Yes, so it's going to start feeding all that molten iron. And you have to remember, there are men standing right next to this molten iron, 
just making sure that it goes where it needs to go. So again, it's a bit of a dangerous job to work down here at the Tredegar Ironworks. Yeah, I'm not going to um, lie, it's already hot and I'm just standing out here in, in the, the sun, sun with it. Yep, yep, <laughs> it's not pleasant, like I said. So once it gets kind of to the top, you're going to cap it off and you actually have to leave it alone. Uh, again, it's molten iron, it needs a second to cool down. Uh, now that varies so much depending on what type of cannon you're making and the size of the cannon. So it could just be a couple of days, it could be up to a week or two weeks that you need it to cool down. It, it's a pretty big variance there. Now, once it cools down, yeah. you can lift this thing out and you can open it. Once you open up the flask, you would have something like this inside, which not quite complete, but as you can see, it is our very tiny aluminum cannon that we have made. Yeah, and wow, was this made out of this particular one too? It was. Wow. Yeah, we actually had our little mini model done. That is so cool. Yeah, so it's aluminum, so it's not going to be as heavy as an iron or bronze gun, obviously. Um, but it gives you a rough idea of what it would have looked like. Um, now, even this, it's it looks pretty complete, but not totally finished up. It's a little rough, you can yeah. see here. A uh, big part is that it's not hollowed out. It's completely solid. Right, straight through the top here. Yes, it's just... solid. Um, so once you get to the Civil War, there is a process of casting a already hollowed out cannon right. uh, that is being used up in northern countries. Not a skill set that they had down here at the Ironworks, so they had to go through the process of basically pouring it out. Uh, and again, that could vary depending on how large the cannon was. A couple days of And, and so, really quickly too, because yeah, I, I understand that there was that process that you could have already hollowed it out. Well, um, apparently there was some resistance of adopting that process by the owner of the ironworks at the time. Yeah. And so they were forced to pour it out themselves they by the, the, the moment of the Civil War. So what are they using to actually pour it out? I mean, this is heavy iron. It is, so you have to use some type of a metal that is stronger than iron, or some bronze guns were cast here as right. well. Uh, so steel is in the most simple terms, it's basically a steel needle, and they just have to kind of hollow it out very slowly. It has to be precise. If it is the slightest bit off in the dimensions, the cannon's no good, really. It's going to misfire constantly, or maybe if it does fire, it's not going to go exactly where you've lined it up to go, which during a war isn't really what you want a cannon to do. Right. Wow. I mean, that's incredible, especially since some of them are rifles too so yes. they have that inner grooving they so they can fire more accurately mm -hmm. and then now here at the Tredegar too not only were they able to craft the cannons that they got from the furnaces all the way out in Botatala down the canal uh, to make them here but then they're built they have the ability to build the carriages on the lake too right they do yeah um, like I said you've got a lot of different buildings that are here lots of different things are happening um, so they would build usually quite often most of the carriages associated with the cannon and they would ship them off in its entirety. So. Well that's incredible. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've covered a lot of information yeah. today. I know this is like it's incredible that you've been able to hold any of this in your head but uh, is there anything else that you kind of want to talk about before we head out today? Um, honestly all I can think of is just how important the Tredegar Iron it was a major reason as to why the city of Richmond was chosen to be the capital of the Confederacy. Um, that's something that kind of confuses a few people, but Tredegar was the largest iron foundry in the southern states by 1860, and it was a major reason as to why this city was even picked to be the capital. Uh, and it continued to be a major part of just Richmond city history going well into the 1950s as well. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. This has been incredible. I hope that you all have learned something. I certainly did. Um, and I am excited for our next for the next installment of our Homefront Education series. But until then, I hope that you'll join us down at the Treasure.